Hello, kids. And welcome to Camp Jeffiot. I, as you know, am Camp Counselor Jeff. And uh, tonight is a very special night because tonight, oof, that's hot, is Halloween. Remember how, ah, spilled that all on my leg. Remember how scary stories used to be? Like, not only how scary they used to be, but how they used to be. And I don't necessarily mean that scary stories used to be better or that they've somehow gotten worse now. On the contrary, we have more available horror stories now than ever before with the internet. However, remember how scary stories used to be to you, how you perceived them, how you consumed them and how you felt about them. Because regardless if you think scary stories in the dark or creep show are better than the SCP Foundation or whatever, you changed in just the same way that horror consumption and the availability of horror has changed over the years. Remember when just a mention of blood or like a white apparition rattling some chains or a decapitated skeleton laughing was enough to turn your blood cold? Before you got all old and cynical and started being able to foresee the twist before it happens or react to any story element and basically say, okay, yeah, this is kind of as in insert another thing you've already seen here because everything is just a retelling of something you've seen before. Well, we at Camp Jeffy remember. We treasure and love that sort of horror storytelling. It's kind of like the building blocks upon which all other horror we've grown to love kind of rests upon. So what I'm gonna do today as camp counselor is I'm gonna allow all you kids to stay up past your bedtime, but only if you can stomach these three horror stories that I'm about to tell you. Now, I wanna be very clear here these are the sort of scary stories that would have been told around a campfire at a summer camp that somehow takes place on Halloween for some reason. And that comes with some caveats. Uh, first of all, you've probably heard at least one of these before. You might have even heard all of them. Second of all, even if you haven't heard of any of these, you might be able to predict what's going to happen or if there's a twist before I even say it. These are the sort of stories that you wouldn't have believed even back then. You would be laughing along until you're alone in your room later that night and you can't stop thinking about it. Now, I don't think that'll happen to you now unless you're, you know, a literal child. And if you are, wrong channel, buddy. There's probably some slime review you could go watch instead. Do that, okay? So everybody gather up, uh, have a seat, take out a blanket and your marshmallows and all of that. And I'm gonna tell you three true stories. These are all true. They've been told to me directly by the people they happen to. And these are trustworthy friends of mine. So no doubt at all that these stories are 100% true. And with that, we'll start with the first story. So this first story comes to me from a very good friend of mine who is a truck driver. Now, when you're a truck driver, sometimes you sleep in the back of the truck, kind of depending on how long of a trip you're doing. Uh, but my buddy was the kind of delivery driver that would go four or five days at a time. And uh, by law, he was required to uh, not only sleep in his truck. So uh, he would stop at all kinds of different bed and breakfasts and other establishments that allow for him to to uh, spend the night and this story comes from one such night where he checks into this little bed and breakfast and let me start by describing how this place looks so it's kind of in the middle of nowhere it's a forest all around all of that this big cottage with this big fancy old house uh, and then on the premise next to the big house there's a smaller house where the service people used to live way back in the day and uh, this smaller house is now being rented out it's kind of like a bed and breakfast airbnb sort of situation now the owner who runs this bed and breakfast is I forgot to turn that light on do i start over no you'll be fine there's more light now so like I said, the owner of this place is this little old lady. She lives in the main house and she rents out the little house. So when my buddy gets there, he calls her up. The number is on the sign outside and she picks up and he says, Hey, I'm outside. I talked to you earlier. And she comes out of the main house, brings him into the little house. She goes behind the little makeshift register that she has there and she points to the right of her. Here's the common room. There's a TV, a couple of armchairs. Feel free to hang out, make yourself at home. And over here are the floor 
one rooms and up these stairs behind me here are the floor two rooms. We got four rooms on each floor. Now let me see what room it was that you had. And she flips through some papers and she goes, oh yes, and then she takes out a key and she goes, room number four, that's for you. He says, thank you very much. And she starts showing him around the premises and he goes, you know what, honestly, it's late, I've been driving all day, I prefer to just head to my room, you can go to bed, it's getting late, you know, I'll, I'll see you tomorrow at breakfast. And she goes, well, okay, if that's what you want. And, and she leaves the house. My buddy turns around and goes up the stairs. There's door one, two, three, four, and the fourth one is obviously the one furthest away. So he goes down the corridor, sticks the key in, turns the key, and nothing happens and he can't get the door open so this is kind of an old building the door is kind of rickety so he starts fiddling with the lock but he really can't get it open and at this point he's thinking wait hold on what if someone else has this room lady messed up and now i'm gonna wake them up so he tries to be a little careful he's turning the key but but he just isn't able to get the door open right so he leans down and and it's one of those keyholes with a little cover thing that you slide to the side like that right so he leans down and he slides it to the side and, and and he looks in and it's very dark in there he can hardly see anything there's a bed in there a bookshelf and it looks empty as far as he can tell until he spots that there is someone in the room in the far corner of the room stands what looks like a person all pale their face is just into the corner of the room. Now my friend loudly gasps and takes several steps back from the door, but he collects himself and he's like, that's super embarrassing. Someone is living in that room. They were probably just coming out of the shower or something. And it just looked to me as if they were standing facing the corner. That's really embarrassing. Uh, I, I'm going to remove myself from the situation. So he walks down the stairs. He takes up his phone. He calls up the old lady again and he says, hey, I think you gave me the wrong key. And she goes, really? My bad, wait, hold on, let me come back. So she comes back, she takes the key, walks straight down the corridor up to door number four, says these doors are kind of rickety sometimes, and she shoves it in and she opens the door while my friend is just standing there knowing that he went up the stairs to room number four up there, not here. So he goes into the room, she says, you know, let me know if you need help with anything else. And he goes, you know what? <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing. I, uh, I tried room number four up there. And you can see that her expression changes. Uh, and she goes, room number four on the second floor? No, 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 it's room number four on this floor. And he says, yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I know that now, but I don't know why, I just assumed it was up there. He goes, no, we don't rent that room out, okay? So you have a good night's sleep and you let me know if you need anything, okay? You just call me if there's anything. And you know, he can tell that her poem got a lot shorter and he starts thinking like, oh, sh should I be apologizing? But you know, she's so quickly out the door and he just goes, well, you know, what can you do? It was an honest mistake. So he goes to bed and he's laying in bed, but he just can't sleep and he can't stop thinking about this room and the way this lady suddenly changed. She went from being so rosy and sweet to being so short and almost rude. So he's laying there tossing and turning. He just can't sleep. But at some point after several hours passed by, he just goes, you know what? I need to find out what's up. So he leaves the room, goes up the stairs, go down the hallway, up to door number four, and as quietly as he can. And his rationale goes, if this person is still standing in the corner, then something's up. Something's weird here. But my friend doesn't believe in the paranormal or anything like that. So so he's kind of rational about it. So he just walks up as quietly as he can. He slowly turns it to the side and he looks. And this time there isn't a person standing in the corner because this time he doesn't really see anything. All he sees is this deep dark red color on the other side. And he goes, did the lady go up and lock the door from the inside? Like it looks like if someone maybe took a bookshelf or something painted red, you know, and, and placed it up against the door. So he stands there and he's looking and then he goes, you know, okay, what else can I do? So he goes back down and uh, eventually falls asleep, manages to get a few hours, wakes up in the morning, ready to get back into his truck. And he walks out and when he passes the common room, the old lady has made breakfast there and she gets his attention. And she says, hey, why don't you come over and have some breakfast before you leave? I know you have to go. You probably have a long trip ahead of you, but come have breakfast with me, just 10 minutes and you know, it's a nice old lady and there's no one else in the common room so he goes yeah sure he goes up and he sits down and at this point he's also thinking like if he sees the the lady from last night from the room he can apologize and explain the situation in case she heard anything at the door so he's sitting there with this old lady and uh, she starts apologizing she says hey sorry if i got a bit rude yesterday i, I just got a bit startled because we we don't actually rent that room out to anyone and my friend kind of stops in his tracks and he goes 
Oh, what do you mean? Someone who works here lives there? And the old lady goes, no, not anymore. And my friend must have gotten this puzzled look on his face because the lady just looks at him and goes, Why, did you see something? And my friend goes, yeah, I could have sworn I saw a person in there. And the lady gives a big sigh, apologizes and says, I know it's kind of silly, but people say it's haunted, so it doesn't surprise me really. Now my friend, again, doesn't really believe in the supernatural, so he thinks, you know, I'll bite. Okay, so what do people say that they have seen? Oh, supposedly hundreds of years ago, uh, one of the maids who worked at the farm took her own life inside that room and it is said that she's haunting it. I guess people usually describe her as this just human female figure but she's completely pale, completely white. And my friend says that at this point he doesn't know what to believe but after she finishes the next sentence my friend thanked her very much, hurried out of there and never returned again because what she said next was that other than this completely pale appearance the only thing that sticks out is her deep red eyes. Well, that's the first one. Anyone want to uh, call their parents? No? You're all good? In that case, let's continue on with the second story of the day. This next story was told to me by an old classmate of mine. She works as a nurse now and she inherited her parents' house out in the countryside. So sometimes she would be driving home, you know, early mornings, sometimes in the middle of the night, sometimes she would get off work at lunchtime. It was just the hours were all over the place. But in this specific instance, uh, she got off work at around 11. This is the dead of winter in Sweden, which is very dark. Um, and uh, again, she lives kind of out on the countryside, so she is in her car. It is a one-lane road out in the countryside. Both sides of her car are just trees. So much deep forest that it's almost like a wall on both sides of the road. And she told me that luckily, since she knows there's a bunch of wildlife and moose and, and uh, deer, she doesn't usually drive very fast uh, going home. And uh, this night was no different. She's kind of taking it slow. And she says if it wasn't for the fact that she was driving so slow, she would have hit it because suddenly she stomps the gas and stops the car because she sees something laying in the middle of the road in front of her. Maybe 20 meters in front of the car, she sees in the middle of the road what looks like a baby. For a few seconds, she just can't wrap her head around what it is that she's looking at. But then it's like she jolts back to reality and realizes, holy shit, what the fuck? So she opens her door and starts fishing her phone out of her pocket as she's running up to this naked baby just in the middle of the road. And she bends down to pick it up. And as she does, she picks it up and she realizes that it's not a baby. It's a doll. Not an old, creepy, stitched doll with button eyes. Just a normal baby doll. And she's looking at it and she's thinking, how did this end up here? Like, I can't imagine some kid dropped it out of the window, like it's in the middle of the road. There's never anyone walking here. And as she's thinking this, she suddenly hears the sound of another car motor. So she turns around and she sees her own car over there, but also maybe just like 50 meters behind her car is now another car that she never saw coming. She doesn't know if maybe it didn't have its headlights on before or something, but now they're on full blast and the car is coming at her and this is when she realized that, that I'm on this one-way road in the middle of nowhere I just got tricked to get out of my car and pick up this doll I might be in danger here so she starts jogging back towards her car and as she does this other car is just speeding towards her car so she gets in just as this other car comes up behind her but instead of stopping behind her he kind of tries to come up next to her like this and she turns the ignition on and she looks and it's dark but she can see that the car stops kind of next to her like this and the door opens and this big guy just steps out of the car and he's shouting something get the fuck out of the car or something of that nature 
and she just steps on the gas full speed ahead, not at all thinking about what if she hits it there at this point, because she's terrified. She checks her rear view mirror, and she sees the guy just go back in his car, slam it shut, straighten himself up on the road, and start following her. And now she's going fast, but so is he. He is catching up on her. And now he's starting to honk the horn like a maniac. You're just slamming the horn repeatedly over and over. And she doesn't know what the fuck she's gonna do. She's out in the middle of nowhere. And at this point, she's coming up on her house. Her house is kind of not far from here, but she doesn't want to lead this guy to her house. So she drives past her house because she knows that there's this uh, T-shaped intersection coming up, right? She slows down enough, he starts slowing down, and then she starts blinking, indicating that she's gonna turn left. And she can see that he's still rolling, but he's starting to open his car door again, looking like he's ready to just run up to her. And that's when she steps on it and she turns the opposite way of what she blinked. He closes the door and tries to follow her, but he has trouble correcting having been ready to turn the other direction. So he kind of skids out and ends up halfway down in a ditch. And she just goes full speed away from there and she can see in the rear view mirror that he is not following her so she takes off on another small little road off the main road and she drives until she is sure that he can't be following her anymore and she just leans back in her car takes a few deep breaths and again this is in the middle of nowhere she is terrified she just feels so alone and threatened in this situation so eventually the thing is she needs to get back to her house obviously so she loops around and goes another way back so that she comes up back to the t-shaped uh, intersection but from the other direction but his car is gone uh, he's left and so at this point she feels pretty sure because again she's pretty close to her house which you know she feels safe at her house so she drives back the way she came constantly looking over her uh, shoulder but she doesn't see anyone and eventually she comes up to the road where her house is and she turns down the road, comes up to the driveway, stops the car, turns it off, takes a deep breath. Like she feels that she's home now. This is safety. This is where she should be. Her dogs are inside. She can hear them barking. And so she gets out of the car, but as she does, she sees down the road coming towards her house two headlights. Now she tells me she doesn't really know what changed. Maybe it was the fact that she felt home but this time she just feels anger. She just feels, what the fuck does this guy want? Who does he think he is? So instead of running away this time, she slams the door shut, takes out her car keys, falls them in her hand, and walks up so that she's kind of aligned to the trunk of her car. And she just stares right towards the car that's coming towards her. And she just stands there and she's standing her ground. And so this car comes up to her and stops and it turns off. And for a second, it all just goes quiet. Then the door of the car opens and out steps this guy. It's still kind of dark, but she can make out his facial features now. And he's just looking at her and he goes, Are you okay? She answers immediately, get the fuck off my property. Come here. She says, what do you want from me? And he says, please, ma'am, come here. And she just goes, listen, I don't know what it is you want, but I want nothing to do with it. Please, why are you doing this? And he says, because when I came up behind you on the road back there, where you were stopped, I saw someone crawl out of the woods and into your back seat. And as he says this, she hears the sound of the back door of her car slamming shut behind her and naked feet against the gravel running into the forest behind her house. So let's bring these in now that we're closing in on the end. That was the second story and uh, there's only one more to go. Now this last story is the one that you are most likely to have heard some variation of before. And this is cozy and all, but let me turn on some more light for you. Yes, like I said, this third story is the one that you are most likely to have heard before. However, like it usually goes with these sort of stories, uh, there's a lot of different versions of it and retellings that are uh, different from each other. This is actually one that was told to me when I was, I want to say maybe 10, no, I must have been younger, maybe seven, and uh, it's kind of gruesome to tell <laughs> a seven-year-old, I think. But regardless, I'm gonna tell it just as it was told to me, as best as I can remember it. And then we'll touch a little bit upon a couple of variations, and then we'll end this 
whole little Halloween celebration thing off with a little bit of a bonus that ties into this last story, but we'll get there. So, this story is actually about my uh, dad's brother and girlfriend back in the 1960s. Uh, I don't know exactly when. And uh, the story goes like this. My uncle and his girlfriend um, had been dating for a while and uh, they loved to take his car and just go, you know, wherever the road takes them. And like a lot of teens back in that time, uh, it wasn't uncommon for them to go to uh, these like lover's lane or basically uh, make out spots, you know, you drive up on some hill, it's kind of secluded, uh, you have a great view of the city, and then you make out and do the things you can't do at home without prying parents and, and annoying, you know, little siblings. So on this particular night, they drove to just one of those locations and they're very happy to notice that they're all by themselves. There's no one else there, which is great. and. Uh, and they're understandably having a good time until the radio switches from the music to a public service announcement or kind of general warning. A voice comes on and says that all residents of the town that they live in are advised to stay inside of their homes with their doors locked and their windows closed until further notice due to the fact that a patient who is deemed highly dangerous and deranged has escaped from the local mental institution. Now my uncle's girlfriend, she gets very worried about this and says that we should probably head home. My uncle, however, reasons that, well, if he's out to kill people, this is probably the last place he would go, seeing that there's literally no one here uh, but us. Why would he go looking here? And she says, well, it doesn't really matter. If they're saying on the radio that we should go home, I want to go home. It's the right thing to do and I don't feel safe. He tries to convince her, it's a bit of back and forth, but eventually, you know, if she wants to go home, he's gonna take her home. So he turns the key uh, in the ignition and the car just coughs and doesn't start. He calmly does it a few times like this, but it doesn't start. He can see that she's starting to freak out already and he turns to her and he goes, listen, okay, don't worry, let me just pop the hood and I'm gonna take a quick look, okay? I'm gonna be in view. Don't worry. I mean, what is she gonna do? She says, okay, please be careful. And he goes out, closes, she locks all the doors. So he pops the hood, takes a good look. And after just a minute or two, he's back in the car. She unlocks it, lets him in and he sits down and he says, well, basically I have some good news and I have some bad news. The good news is that the car isn't broken. The bad news is that the battery has drained from leaving the radio on. Now he can see that she's really starting to freak out at this point and he goes, I've already thought this through and I think that there are basically three options and I will tell you all three of them and then which one I think that we should do. Option number one, we stay in the car all night and we wait until it's light out and then we walk back. However, I think my parents are gonna be very worried about me. I think your parents are gonna feel the same about you. And also with this whole killer on the loose, I don't think that really feels fair and the police will get involved and it'll be a whole thing. The second alternative is that you and I walk down to the gas station and find someone who's willing to drive their car up here and jumpstart my car. And the third option, and this is the one that I think we should do, is same as option two, but you stay here and I go down. That way I'm sure that you're safe. You know exactly where I'm going. It's just down to the gas station, which is about 30 minutes away from here. And I'll be back within an hour and then we can go home. Now she objects to this uh, at first because, well, first of all, she doesn't want to be left alone, but she also doesn't want him to walk out into the darkness himself after such a warning has been given on the radio. But he ensures her, he says, listen, I have my flashlight. It's like a 30 minute walk. I'll be fine, I promise. And at this point, she's starting to accept that maybe this is the best option, but she's still worried and she says, well, what do I do? Do I just sit here in a dead car in the middle of nowhere? And he goes, no, I've thought about this too. So what we do is we lay you down in the back seat. I have a blanket that we'll put over you. That way, even if the crazy spooky killer does come here, well, he'll look in through the window and he'll just see an empty car. And he's not out for cars, he's out for blood. So you'll be fine. And while she doesn't appreciate how kind of wishy-washy he's being about this. 
he does have a point and this sounds like the best alternative so without much further discussion she lays down in the back seat he covers her he says i'll be back and he gets ready to leave and right before he leaves he says one last thing when i come back i'm gonna knock on the car okay and you keep the doors locked and you lay still until you've heard my exact knock okay it's gonna be like this Three times, nothing more, nothing less. And before you hear that third knock, you don't move. Because if someone else comes up here knocking, I don't want you getting up from under your blanket. And she says, yes, okay, that sounds reasonable. Yeah, and he goes, I love you, baby. I'll talk to you soon. Please, don't worry. And he gets up and he walks away into the darkness. Now she's laying there in the dark and she is terrified. She hates that they ended up in this situation and she's angry at him, uh, kind of blaming him for letting the battery drain out but at the same time she kind of feels bad like she was obviously part of this as well and as she's laying there she actually eventually winds up being able to fall asleep suddenly she's startled awake she doesn't know how long she's been out at this point and she's not sure really why she woke up until she hears she lays completely still as instructed until she hears now she's wondering did the first knock wake me up was that the third knock, or is there gonna be another one? She lays still and just listens, and then... And at this point she goes, that's it, this is him. She's just about to get up and unlock the door when... Another knock. Yet another one. One more. And it goes like this. Terrified. She lays in the back seat of the car as these continuous knocks ring out through the entire car. She thinks to herself, is it like a twig blowing against the car or something? But no, it's too rhythmic and it keeps going and it doesn't stop. She lays there in the back of the car and she doesn't know how much time passes, but it must have been hours because eventually the sun starts to slowly rise outside the car, but the knocking doesn't stop. Eventually, after what feels like an eternity, she hears the sound of another car driving up. And then another car. The knocking is still going on. And she is frozen in place. Suddenly she hears a voice. City name police department, we've got you surrounded. And with this, her paralysis just breaks. She sits down, she tears the blanket off of herself, and she opens the door to the car and there's two police cars parked about 50 meters ahead of her. Four officers in total, two at that car, two at that car. One over there has his gun drawn, the other is talking into a megaphone. These two are just watching, hands on her holster. She sees that they notice her and they're looking straight at her and then they look at each other and then the man with the megaphone turns back and he says ma'am stay in the car but that's the last thing she wants to do at this point she's been in this car for hours with this maddening knocking going on in the background so she completely ignores what the cop says and she gets out of the car and now she sees that all of them draw their guns she stops in her tracks and puts her hands over her head and says i just want to go home one of the officers shout Walk slowly towards me. She keeps her hands over her head. That's good. Just keep walking towards me, man. And she keeps going. She can't understand what is going on. Where is her boyfriend? Why are the cops here? She knows that it's not legal to just sleep in the car anywhere, but she can't imagine that four officers would draw their guns just for that. And then the cop says, Keep going just like that and do not turn around. Now the cop could have as well said nothing or asked her to please turn around because of course she is gonna turn her head. When she does, she sees a man on the roof of her car holding her boyfriend's head in his hands, repeatedly slamming it against the car roof. And that's the third story. I accidentally zoomed the camera out a little bit. From the little bit of research I've done on this story, it seems that in the European version, uh, it usually goes just like how I told it, and ending with the head being slammed on the car. Uh, but in the, I guess, American version of this story, it goes a little bit differently because they get the same message on the radio, except for a detail that is that the escaped mental patient has a hook for a hand. 
and uh, when they get the message they immediately peel out of there the car isn't broken and they get home and they step out of the car and when they do they see that on the passenger side's door handle hangs a hooked hand so implying that he was just about to open the door when they drove away a little bit more child friendly that version and uh, that concludes all three stories for us here today hello jeff from the editing room here uh so as i'm sitting here editing this i noticed that nightmind just uploaded one of his halloween videos so i have that on my second monitor and then at one point he just starts talking about this exact story and also goes into the different variations of it uh, making my research look fucking pathetic because I hardly did any research I was just basically talking about that I've noticed there are differences so if you really want to know more about it go check that video out I'll put a card in the corner thing but most of all I'm just so weirded out by the fact that I've never heard anyone talk about the fact that there are different versions of this story and then he releases a video and I re yeah you get it okay uh, back to me again I hope that you could get at least a little bit of that feeling back of hearing these sort of kind of silly horror stories that used to scare us as kids or maybe they didn't use to scare you but if you're here watching and you've watched this far i have to imagine that you do have some sort of interest in horror stories regardless i promised a little bit of a bonus here at the end and i fully intend to keep that promise it's a really short one and it has to do with this last one this is the only story in this video that i'm gonna be straight up reading from my phone because i want to make sure that i get it 100 percent right so on june 19th 2012 uh, there was a post on the 4chan board X. 4chan is known for, you know, being trolls and racist and all of that, but if you've never been there, the thing is that there are a bunch of different boards with different themes to them. There's one for politics, there's one for sports, there's one for video games, one for food, all of that. Most of the media covered uh, atrocious stuff goes on on the random board slash B. Uh, but this takes place on slash X, which is the paranormal board. And like I said, there was a post there uh, by an anonymous user uh, on this day. And I just want to read it to you just like it was posted. Because this very short story holds a very special place in my heart. And uh, here it goes. Man and girl go out to drive under moonlight. They stop at on at a side of road. He turned to his girl and say, Baby, I love you very much. What is it, honey? Our car is broken down. I think the engine is broken. I'll walk and get some more fuel. Okay. I'll stay here and look after our stereo. There have been news reports of stereos being stolen. Good idea. Keep the doors locked no matter what. I love you, sweetie. So the guy left to get full for the car. After two hours, the girl say, Where is my baby? He was supposed to be back by now. Then the girl hear a scratching sound and voice say, Let me in. The girl doesn't do it, and then after a while she goes to sleep. The next morning she wakes up and finds her boyfriend still not there. She gets out to check and Mandor handhook car door 